This morning, we want to start by talking about uh, World Day for Safety and Health at Work. And we have with us Mr. Robert Tiloxing, who is a health and safety expert. Mm -hmm. I would like to say thank you very much. And thank good you morning. for having me. Good morning. Uh, so this year, uh, World Day for Safety and Health at Work is on Saturday, April 28th. Yeah. And the World Day for Safety and Health at Work and the World Day Against Child Labor, they are partnering in a joint campaign to improve safety and health of young workers and end the child labor. Right, correct. Um, the whole effort is to encourage countries, government, organizations, um, employers that, you know, to discourage one, hiring young children to do work. And, and, and we are looking at, you know, the legal age group of 15 to 24, mm -hmm. which, which are young people at work. Under our Occupational Health and Safety Act, we have dealt with that in terms of Trinidad and Tobago says they recognize a young person at work as being of the age of 16 and under the age of 18. So they fall well within that group. But we take the group to the to, to tw to age 24 mm -hmm. because that's when somebody now goes out to work for the first time. And they're, they're fairly young in the, in the workforce. They're fairly inexperienced in the workforce and therefore can be taken advantage of. So there are a lot of hazards that, that come with going out to work for the first time. And then going out in industries that you're not accustomed to or wasn't trained to work in. And even with the health and safety requirements are not totally in place in many of these um, employers or, or businesses. In a lot of cases during the July-August vacation, children mm -hmm. would actually go and get jobs and that kind of thing. Right. And guess what? They're included in that. We also include people who do part-time work, those who have left school early in apprenticeship programs, those are in vocational programs, those who are working for their families, mm -hmm. you know, um, the, this type of thing. We don't see a lot of that anymore in the Caribbean so much. Um, I remember the interview with former Prime Minister Bas Diopande talking about that during his trade union days, mm -hmm. where they fought, the, 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 um, they were fighting for the, the rights of workers, where the worker had to do a certain amount of cane every day in order to be paid. While the father could have chopped that much and bundled it, the mother did not have the, the wear at all physically to do it, and they needed the money. So they will take the children out of school, bring them into the cane field, so while the mother cut, the, the kids would bundle. And finally, they stopped letting kids come into the workforce. We have done that through our Occupational Health and Safety Act, through our tra Child um, Employment Act. So therefore, children could only be employed, and those, be and again, young persons between of the age of 16 and under 18 between the hours of 6 a.m. and 7 p.m., no later than that. So when it comes to legislation and laws to protect children in Trinidad, you would say that we are on the right track? Yes. We, we, have, we have signed off on many of the ILO conventions to deal with that, and we have implemented these laws. Now, the plan is to try and eradicate... Um, child labor and those things by 2030, 2025, 2030, part of the Sustainable Development Goals. Right. So part of the Sustainable Development Goals is, is that, is that um, by 2030, right, we will see the eradication of children working in hazardous work areas. And I find hazardous. Hazardous would be where the work, workplace would have things such as um, working at heights, confined spaces, um, using tools that are sharp, that could easily cut you, where there are no guards. What, whatever the type of work is being done, the task is being carried out. If there's the possibility of the person carrying on the task to be hurt, then there's a hazard there. Mm -hmm. And therefore, especially with young people, because of the inexperience and not being properly trained, they are more at risk than any other group of, of being um, harmed in the workplace. And at 2025, they want to end all forms of child labor, as I'm, I was reading this morning. Uh, exactly so, because child labor is still one of the largest labor force in the world today, especially in the migrant population, mm -hmm. especially in construction industry, and, and also in the hospitality industry. Mm. Because um, according to the International Labor Organization, 541 million young workers, that is between 15 and 24, mm -hmm. which include 37 million children, they work in hazardous um, conditions and under hazardous conditions yeah. that's correct and, and and coming out of this or coming out of the brief that has been coming out, out of the ILO which is the National Labor Organization mm -hmm. for World Health Day they have many things have been put in place by other countries and they're trying to get other countries to get involved 
and start putting these things in place so that we can really correct this situation where children are put at risk in the workplace. Um, really and truly, we even look at pe families. You bring your children to work with you, you bring your children into your workplace, and they are up and down in the workplace. They are at the same risk that you are. Mm -hmm. Now, you have on the PPEs, you may have on the proper shoes, you may have the proper guidance, but the kids are running free. So, who are you putting more at risk, yourself yeah. or the children? Because they say uh, the world's labor force, uh, well, 40% mm. of these young people, uh, they suffer non-fatal occupational injuries than the adults, 40% more. More, that's than correct. The adults. And again, that's because of experience, lack of job skills. Um, in some cases, lesser education, because they may be taking a job because the family needs the money. They may be taking a job because they don't have a choice in terms of educational prospects mm -hmm. before them. Um, we see a lot in the migrant population in the United States and throughout Europe, the people who pick your fruits, such as in Florida, right? The father and mother did it, their mother and father did it, so therefore they expect their children to do it. And at times when they're shorthanded, they will actually bring the children into the field. But now there are laws in the United States that govern that this cannot happen, right? Your farmer, the owner of the property, cannot allow this to happen. So therefore, the age group for employment is, is um, clearly defined. But it happens in Trinidad still as well, even though we yeah. have laws in place. Even though we have laws in place, because look at it this way. The family needs the subsistence. So therefore, if they, um, they have a business, on the weekend they will accept, they will want the children to come into the business and help them. It, it, it's a good way of teaching children about business, but you have to realize you are putting them at risk. Because if you are letting a young child handle a knife, Mm -hmm. because he's cutting something to serve to a customer. Was he properly trained in handling a knife? Is he at the right height for the countertop? Are, are, are the, the, the equipment within the, the, the organization have the guards and so forth? Do they understand the hazards involved with using this type of equipment? And we take it for granted, oh, that's my daughter. They'll inherit the business one day, and therefore it's okay for them to come and work here. But then they get injured. And many of this go unreported. Eh? So a lot of the figures you are seeing there, there's almost a 20 to 30 percent underreporting of this. Yeah, and, and those figures are... Are huge. Are huge. Are huge. Are there any figures for Trinidad and Tobago? Unfortunately, none that I could have gotten a hold of. So, uh, one of the things that we are looking at in many countries, and, and especially in the Caribbean, especially with the onslaught of our Occupational Health and Safety Act within the last 10 years and throughout the Caribbean, we are trying to standardize how you collect data, mm -hmm. what data is being collected, and also that we are sharing this data. And, and that's one of the programs under the Decent Work Program of the, of the International Labor Organization here in the, in the region to get um, countries and businesses. Businesses in the Caribbean do not like to share data. They feel they're giving away com company secrets. Somebody will use it against them. So when you send out information to businesses asking them, well, how many injuries did you have? What type of injuries did they have? They either underreport it or don't report it at all. And they don't realize what they're doing is hindering the organizations such as OSHA and the organized to develop programs to help them do this. Accidents and injuries cost us almost 34.5% of GDP worldwide. That's a huge figure mm -hmm. of money going out there which could go back into the business to help make it better. But you're spending it now on accidents, on people being injured, lost time, workers' compensation, all of these other things. So, but Trinidad and Tobago, the laws are in place, but you still see it happening. And it's not just in Trinidad, it's something that is happening worldwide. Hence, they came together to yeah. partner. And, that, and that's something that, um, having worked throughout the region and, and worldwide, I tell people a lot, they say, oh, it's Trinidad and Tobago, and, and we are lax in this. No, mm -hmm. we're not. To tell you the truth, OSHA does a fantastic job in this country and throughout the region. Many businesses, and I would say at least 45% of the businesses in Trinidad and Tobago today, comply with OSHA regulations. Um, what's that figure? 45%. Yeah, but that's a low figure. Let me finish. Then you have another 40% who want to comply, mm -hmm. but don't know how to. And they're looking for assistance. And sometimes it's a matter of financing and so forth to put these things in place. And then you have a 20% that just don't care, right? So let's be realistic about it. Many businesses recognize the need for putting health and safety and, uh, uh, 
um, programs in place. It does help the business. It's a management system. It's not just about incidents and accidents. There's a lot more into it. But many of them just don't have the where at all or the resources to do it. And that's where OSHA is developing programs to help these, pro these, these businesses through various um, entities develop these programs. So therefore, we can start looking at higher figures of 65 70 percent maybe in the next two or three years of compliance within the country. And, and that is the goal? And that is the goal. So what is Trinidad and Tobago doing as we commemorate uh, uh, World Day for Safety and Health at the work on Saturday, April 28th? Well, I know there are several um, things on through things like the National Safety Council and some of the other entities are having their own private health and safety programs and so forth. Um, specifically to deal with young people, I am not sure. Mm -hmm. I haven't gotten back any feedback from that. But I know that you know, every year there are several events that are, that are put on, and during Health and Safety Week as well. And I have to ask you about the unions and the role unions play in such a situation. Well, it's, it's called um, tripartite. Government, employer, employee and employee organizations, of course. And they get together in order that they can help develop the type of laws and put the type of standards in place that will protect the employer and the employee in the workplace. Because the employer is also at risk too in some ways, eh? not mm -hmm. just by liability, but also to he is working in the workplace. So he, he's also uh, exposed to the risk, right? So therefore, the employee organizations play a great role in making sure that the employees wear the PPEs properly, that they comply to, to health and safety standards and rules within the workplace? Mm -hmm. And how do we do corrective action if something goes wrong? How do we bring the employees in and sit down at the safety committee level and at other levels at the board level and say, okay, this went up, this happened. How do we deal with this? How do we do corrective action to ensure it doesn't happen again? The training comes first. You have to train them first and then. Right. But a lot of times, you know, actually sitting down in a classroom and telling people that mm -hmm. this is what you should do, this is what you shouldn't do because it can lead to this. It, it doesn't really resonate in the person until something actually happens. That's true. And hence the saying nobody does anything about it until the person is mm -hmm. injured. Um, the reporting of, of, of behavior such as unwanted behavior or hazardous or, or dangerous behavior is the first rule. And it's under our act that every employee shall report unsafe acts to their employer. It's not tattletaling. It's not telling on your fellow employees. It's ensuring that that person's life first is being looked after and that his actions or inactions wouldn't cause somebody else also to be hurt. And we don't always look at it that way by our inactions. Many times it's not what you do, but what you don't do that causes an injury to happen. Mr. Robert Tiloxing, I would like to thank you very much for joining us on Good Morning Trinidad and Tobago to talk with us about World Safety for World Day for Safety and Health at the Workplace. It was a pleasure having you, and I'm hoping you very much for having you know, we can accomplish our goals in the near future. Thank you very this much. This is Good Morning Trinidad and Tobago. We take a break and come back with more. <laughs>